don't get used to seeing color in this review because you're not going to see a lot of it. Ayo, what is up everyone? It is the Alpha J of the Alpha J Show, and today we're gonna talk about SpongeBob Squid Noor versus the Fairly Odd Parents episode, Where's Wanda? And see which one is better. With five months since my last versus, I think we are long overdue for a new one. Before we even get into this, just look at that title card. It looks incredible. And I also love the music they chose for this because it really fits the mood they were going for. The first few scenes have quite a bit to talk about, so sit back. The first image we get literally the first through the bubble transition are these jellyfish really close to the crusty crab which doesn't really happen that often if you think about it but they don't seem to be affected by squidward's clearly bad clarinet performance even with the toxic notes depicted to be so through their distorted and sort of crushed design we actually get flats or someone who looks very similar to him in the background which is a very neat touch i am aware that these newer episodes are not a to show minor characters that we've sort of grown up watching and I think these new writers tend to connect with pre-season characters a lot more because a lot of them most likely grew up watching it. I'm 20 at least at the time of recording this video so if I were to become a writer I can say that I grew up watching the show that I would hypothetically work on. It really does help with the immersion and keeping this sort of Spongebob culture or lore and not having Spongebob just be the show that Nickelodeon really relies on. We we also have this pretty gruesome scene of a bikini bottomite ripping his eyes out and using them as ears. Don't worry guys, you'll find that neat boundary between funny, weird, and brutal if you keep trying, but that was not it. With everyone in the Krusty Krab in near agony, Krabs confronts Squidward and tells him to take that racket somewhere else, as Squidward is only trying to practice for an open mic night. The beginning of this episode shows a lot of promise because it gets straight to the point, but provides tons of jokes as well. And I hear that style is common in modern Spongebob episodes, particularly this latest season. We also get bubble baths, and you have to remember the first times we saw bubble baths were in episodes like Pickles and Fun, where in both shots, he appeared to be more of a pompous jerk. We also then see him in Bulletin Board, sort of shifting his role to be more of a jerk who has influence, being more of a critic but also a voice of the masses, so it's not necessarily like his performance in Pickles and Fun, where it was shown that he doesn't necessarily necessarily have people who like him. So it is nice to see him go from the guy that no one really liked to this nerd who collects these supposedly rare and mint condition figurines. Unfortunately for the squid, he was in the wrong place, wrong time, and that leads into this scene here. You will remove that subpar woodwind from the premises ere I snap its reed. That's such a great line. Squidward then, with Bubble Bass's help, experiments with the interior design, giving us the Squid Model 0-C with the optional air hole. With being kicked out of the Krusty Krab for practicing the clarinet, and being kicked out of the, well, outside of a comic book store, for practicing the clarinet, he is then stopped by Patrick, who was playing with rocks, for essentially just practicing the clarinet in his own home. Again, they try these jokes that look pretty brutal, but it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like these jokes work here. It feels actually like these jokes would work better in another show. It's like, imagine if I were to make a really, really good cooking video. Like I make a giant Gary cake with the shell and you like the video. Tap the like button on it. Yeah, it's a good video, but does it belong on this channel where I make primarily animation reviews? Regardless of the quality of the video, it would still feel out of place, right? So after a really unnecessarily frilly skip to set down a freaking instrument and a nap, we get this scene here. Are you ready, my dear? We've got the- <laughs> ah! 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 That's how it began. My life smashed to bits. My living room covered in broken dreams. This leads us into the detective bit. And can I just say the voice acting here is so well done. I feel the atmosphere they wanted to create. Given that we're talking about Spongebob here, it sort of brings back those experimental episodes where not everyone will work, but the concept and the idea was so out there and it came from a place of genuine creativity, imagination, and just the willingness to try different ideas that I enjoy it. I really enjoy how with the limited color palette, 
the show still pops with clarity between the objects, characters, and things of that nature. Also, the music is really great here and really needed that change. So now that you know how this mystery starts, let's switch over to Where's Wanda. Unlike Squid Baby, this episode gets straight to the mystery part with Timmy calling out a shadowy figure for taking Wanda. One thing I enjoy about this is that with Timmy's narration, like Squidward, it's incredibly great and it adds to what the episode wanted to do. I found him explaining one thing and the other thing happening to be much funnier here than in later seasons, you know when I say things like and then the opposite happens, because it doesn't happen often and thus you cannot see the joke from a mile away because you've already heard it so much. Now granted this was the first instance of it. So it is parent teacher Knight and Cosmo and Wanda have to go away for a fairy related tests or something, something about probation. Fortunately for Timmy who needs his fairies because the night involves classic movies, involves Cosmo and Wanda in another truly funny scene. I do enjoy the style of early Fairly Odd Parents throwing in tons of just very jokes because it works so well and this style even translates into Hartman's other work like Tough Puppy. I think one of the main distinctions between earlier and later Fairly Odd Parents is the keyword varied. We then get to see like in the style of Squid Noir our suspects. Trixie who fancies the Casablanca setting because girls like romance. AJ picking the Frankenstein idea because nerds like fiction and Francis picking the Rocky theme because bullies like fighting. Timmy picks Jaws because of the lack of in his character design and we get this scene here. Oh Timmy, how fishrific! Your display is so lame you couldn't possibly have had any help from your parents. First prize goes to Timmy Turner! Okay, so earlier Timmy said, And the reason why he won was because of the lack of a parent? There's something really wrong with that statement. Now, you may be wondering when the mystery element comes into play. Well... And then, it happened. The light's out! A scream in the night! <laughs> something was wrong! Wanda was missing! I don't know why, but that scream always gets to me. It's so obviously over the top for no reason at all. It's like the scream you'd hear in a low budget horror game that mismatches it with something that doesn't match its intensity. It may seem like I don't have much to say for Where's Wanda opposed to Squid Noir, and that's because it's a lot of jokes. It's a story built on a very simple plot, and most of it is obvious that it's funny, like so. All right, nobody move! We do have Cosmo being very distraught that Wanda isn't around, but he doesn't have faith in Timmy. Because it's not like he's a detective or anything, until he is. I should also note that Timmy's dad is wondering why he isn't a suspect, and that will come back later. So with AJ, Trixie, and Francis as prime suspects, it just now gets down to who did it. And we'll find out after we get back to Squid Noir. Getting back over to Squid Noir, Squidward has his first suspect, SpongeBob, who actually has not been seen in this episode at all up to this point. We've only seen Mr. Krabs, Bubble Bass, Patrick, some jellyfish, and flats in the far background, aside from a few other bikini bottomites. I'm not sure why he would be the prime suspect, but it actually does remind me of how Squidward was paranoid of SpongeBob and Squidward in Clarinet Land. When it came to paying the stupid bill, SpongeBob always tipped 20%. He had to be involved. These are some truly great lines in this episode. Squidward tries to get the info out of the sponge, but he truly doesn't know what happened, and says that he has nothing to do with the disappearance, showing grandma's kisses, hmm, hmm, episode reference, as his alibi. I definitely enjoy SpongeBob's bombastic personality bouncing off of what is clearly Squidward's very serious and to the point demeanor. I think it works really well because it breaks his, as SpongeBob put it, hard boiled personality, and it allows him to have the dynamic of dealing with the insanity around him. Oh, Squidward. Don't you know a suspect is just a friend you haven't cleared of charges yet? Never, ever say that line again at any point in your life. You know what I like more than the dynamic of a hyper and energetic SpongeBob bouncing off of a serious detective squid? A sponge pretending to be serious and play a sidekick role to a serious squid but failing miserably because he's comically clumsy. The chemistry is actually so on point here. So we get Squidward drenching this guy with an umbrella too bad we didn't have the budget for him to react 
and also more of these narrations. What I enjoy about the narrations are the fact that it's contrasted with the environment around him. He's in Bikini Bottom, a somewhat wacky place, and I think doing that style with the detective aspect works really well. The episode could have simply played this straight or at least have more people playing along like in Pull Up a Barrel, where the story had characters we knew in it, thus more people playing along in the story that Krabs told. Or the episode could have had a disastrous attempt with a lack of black and white and straight up having Squidward going around and unsuccessfully getting answers, showing how powerless he can be around others. So I'm really glad they went with this attempt. Approaching the Krusty Krab to ask the crustiest of crustaceans what he had to do with the disappearance of a clarinet, we get... Oh my god, are our legends true? Is that real water overlaid over? Oh man, I've been asking for this for years! Yes! Okay, major points added there. I'm not sure when this starts to happen, but I am so grateful to see it here. I know this sum, it seems like a very minute thing, but I truly missed it. And I believe I talk about it more in my season 1 bracket. Also, insert commentary on Spongebob flipping his coin. Getting back to this though, we get Crab Borg 2.0 with Spongebob and Squidward trying to interrogate Mr. Krabs, but not being on the same page. I still enjoyed the original attempt more, but this one was pretty funny. I definitely think the attempt on the much more detailed Krabs is actually their best attempt at this bizarre and surreal comedy that they go for. It does fall in line with the sort of pre-movie charm a lot better than the headless Squidward or the guy who ripped his eyes out and put it in his ears. I also enjoyed the sort of escalation they did with the good cop, good cop dynamic. However, it would all prove to be for nothing as Krabs Krabs doesn't know anything about the missing clarinet. This leads into, you guessed it, the Near Mint comic book store, which has the next suspect just in time. And then, from the depths of the barbecue, comes the ferocious, fire-breathing gag! Really, I get all dressed up, I was about to binge Sea World of Warcraft and grind a bit, you know, do some raiding. But no, I, I came here because you said that Dungeons and Dragons was gonna be, oh, I'm sorry, let me read your exact quote. Lit LMFAO, 100 sign, 100 sign, fire emoji. And with all of the one and a quarter brain cells you have left, after eating the double trippy bossy deluxe on the raft 4x4 animal style, extra shingles with a shimmy and a squeeze, light axle grease making it cry, burning it, and let it swim, you decide to start off our adventure in a comic book store full of these imaginative epic creatures all around you with the suburban get that out of my face I'm done <laughs> You've got me cornered but I won't give up without a fight! Now that was a really great scene. I really enjoyed the action, the twist was really well handled, and I really enjoy that it plays with the environment, and that's a really easy way to brainstorm some creative things to do. Where were you this afternoon? Where's Squidward's clarinet? I don't know what you're talking about. I was here all day. Now with only one suspect left, that leaves it down to the one last person we haven't seen that had a major role. So was it him? Well, we'll learn soon. But for now, let's switch back over to Where's Wanda? A great ton of this episode is a prime example of the comedy I missed in newer Fairly Odd Parents. So instead of skipping over most of the jokes, let's do something unique with this episode. I'm going to show you exactly what kind of older comedy Fairly Odd Parents had. I did not steal your fish! Wasn't lying. You see, it knows when to go from joke to joke and have the story continue. Also, add on to the fact that in this episode we didn't need Cosmo to lose his wand. A la Big Fairy Share Scare, a la Girly Squirrely, a la Fairly Odd Pet, a la The Awful Crossover, and so many more. The story works just how it is because it was written as a good story first and not a Fairly Odd Parent story. This could work in other shows like we're seeing now, and that's because these characters actually have personalities. And what works tremendously here is that Timmy, despite being the hard-boiled detective, is still Timmy. So of course he isn't gonna get Francis to crumble to his knees and fess up. This would be the perfect way to have him react. We didn't need a and then the opposite happens joke. It works the way it does. This leads into AJ, who for some odd reason has this special display for the movie night award. I don't know how to feel about that. Should I think AJ is pathetic for having a dumb movie night award be the highlight on his trophy? 
trophy case when literally one of them says best on it. Literally the word best. Or should I feel stupid because that was the animator's way of making sure that we understood that there was an empty spot on the shelf. Either way, we get this. I wasn't anywhere near your fish. And even if I had taken your fish, my sleeves would have been wet. Darn it! He had me! Don't let Freakin' Bald off the hook. He could have easily had a different coat, or could have been lying altogether. His gloves can reach far down in that fish bowl before getting wet. And even then, his dad could have taken the fish. He doesn't have you, Timmy. Where are you going? With Francis apparently not the guy, and AJ apparently not the guy, it leaves one last person competing with him, and that hilariously small in hindsight competition. I guess Chester's dad was too busy losing baseball. We also get more of Cosmo trying to dissuade Timmy away from trying to find Wanda. Now, why would Cosmo want to do that? He's married to this woman. And clearly he didn't have a problem with her earlier as earlier. He was cleaning up the castle and Wanda was making food and he didn't really show to the audience at least that he had a problem with her. Oh, and I should probably say that the interrogation styles mimic things that happened in their respective movies. But considering that's obvious and considering they were already doing that with the whole parent-teacher night conference, it just seemed like something to know. So with the last culprit Timmy confronts Trixie and again it is a lot of comedy but also just keeping the story as a priority which I respect. No pets on the plane! What? what? No pets allowed! No pets allowed! She couldn't have had Wanda. She could have, well, she could have killed, she killed, never mind. Anyway, with all three of these suspects not being the right one, who could it be then? Well, let's find out after going back over to Squidnor. Finishing up Squidnor, we get Squidward confronting the star over his clarinet. It should be noted that he's eating something. And because of that fact, we cannot see the color of it. That actually provides a great twist for what is to come. Patrick obviously acts like an idiot while being questioned as pressure doesn't work on the sea star. However, However, just like Mr. Krabs and just like Bubble Bass, the star is innocent and we actually find out that the goo is jellyfish jelly. However, it does lead me into thinking, so do the other characters also see in black and white the way that we do? And if so, wasn't it a little weird for them to transition over? I guess everyone in the sea probably didn't even notice. I say this because the characters also mistake the jelly for goo. But anyway, they realize that the true culprit must be at Jellyfish Fields. My baby! <laughs> 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 Now that was a great twist. Originally, I wasn't truly expecting this because you only see the jellyfish towards the beginning of the episode. So if you missed it there, then you might as well have not seen this coming either. I'd say they've learned that crime doesn't play. <laughs> Jesus, Bambo and Christ, Patrick, calm down. We should solve another mystery now. Yeah, how about we solve the mystery of why that looks so brutal? I think I've only seen Patrick slap SpongeBob with that much intensity in such a casual way once and that was in something smells where spongebob had to physically stop patrick from slapping him again so with the mystery solved here's some final notes i thought the coin thing was very stupid we also have this built jellyfish it looks pretty cool and what or who was mr krabs twirling his hair for was it squidward did he act does he actually like like does he i give up anyway the episode ends with squidward's monologue and that was squid noir getting back over and finishing up where's wanda we have Timmy's dad finally confronting Timmy and he calls him the most honest person he knows. It's like he selectively forgot all of those times that his dad has tried to kill Dinklebird. Granted, a lot of those times were after this episode, but there were some times before this episode. But Timmy is really adamant that it wasn't his dad. His dad could have not possibly did it. It actually brings up a great question. Okay, so Principal Waxoplax gave Timmy the win because the display looked like it couldn't have possibly received help from any of the parents but his dad was there at the parent-teacher movie night? It's small questions like that that jab the story and create plot holes, but we get some more contemplating before Cosmo leaves in a hurry to face Jorgen alone. Little does he know that was the clue that gave Timmy the answer to who it must be without a shadow of a doubt. One clever poke at the fourth wall and we get to what was the beginning of this episode. I love the story structure and I really wish more episodes would do this sort of style where you tease the middle or you tease the ending of the episode. I know gaming YouTubers love to do that with a really neat scene of the gameplay. And it works for a reason. It shows us what will come and what will lead up to it, building easy anticipation. Final Space does this perfectly, by the way. So Cosmo is the culprit and just listen
listen to this scene. You hate to be alone. I do. But you love Wanda. I do. Enough to send her away before your probation hearing. Because you didn't want to do something stupid and make Wanda suffer level 13 probation. There's a, there's a question or two in there where I don't think you should be confused on the answer. But with some level 14 persuasion skills by Timmy, we get Wanda back. Covered in chocolate from Chocolate City, Utah. Unfortunately, because Jorgen requires a strict diet of panic and fear before the probation is over, Wanda is punished due to Cosmo's error in judgment. Some people may look at this and rant because of how it makes Cosmo's actions look mean-spirited or makes him look unlikable, and I don't care. The episode ends with another gag of Timmy's dad, and that was Where's Wanda? Well, with both of these mysteries solved, we now have the biggest mystery of them all. Which episode was better? Well, Where's Wanda had a great structure with a lot of funny jokes is stuck to the point and overall has a lot of rewatchability going for it. However, Squid Noir had a great performance by Squidward, a very impressively solid story, as well as creative combinations for a comedy and a bigger twist. If you were to put my panda paw to the fire, I would slightly edge my vote to Squid Noir, but both episodes are really good in their own right. What do you think? What episode you thought was better? Let me know in the comments down below. I did promise I'd read all of your lovely names out in my next video, so let's do this. I want to give a special thank you to Andrew Pollard, Benjamin Fency, C.R. Martin, Green Ninja Lord, Jake McFarlane, Jeff, Josh Strider, Maria Kutsu, Meowmers, McBiscuit, Noah, Rabbit Tears Blog, Ridley Craid, Ross Pitt, Teddy, The Crimson Mayhem, V Gold, Zlypith, Yoka Beer, and Zoe Talamantes. You guys really help support what I do, and I really do thank everyone who contributes. And if you want to, I will leave my Patreon link in the description below as well as in the card. Make sure to follow me at the Alpha J Show and go into my request video for any other topic that you think I should cover. If you really like this video, you should check out my entire versus playlist for more on this style of review, particularly my Mimic Madness versus Band Geeks one, as that one is a pretty good one as well. Make sure to subscribe and I'll talk to you guys next time. I hope your time is well spent and Alpha out.